Hey friends, it's Melvin. Thanks for tuning into this episode. Here's just a few quick things I wanted to notify you guys about before we get started. First up, very soon, new episodes will be releasing Wednesday mornings rather than Tuesday. So don't panic if you don't see a new episode on Tuesday. Just wait a little longer and you'll see it in your feed. Second, we've introduced a mailbag. Check those show notes and toward the bottom you'll see a mailbag link. You'll then be able to text us any questions you might have about movies, the movie industry, or any movie slash Christian related questions you might have. Then we'll respond in a future episode, so send us your questions now. Up next, Patreon polls, which are available to Patreon supporters at the $3 tier or higher, have been updated. Supporters can now suggest films or shows to be reviewed at the end of each month. The two most liked submissions will become the options for the Patreon poll, so if you want to hear us talk about your favorite movie or show, join our Patreon and start campaigning. And lastly, whether you're a new or long-time listener, please consider writing a review or rating the Cinematic Doctrine podcast on iTunes and Spotify. Apart from financially supporting on Patreon, these are the two most helpful ways to support the show. And that's it. Enjoy the episode. Welcome to Monthly Movie News, a monthly segment on Cinematic Doctrine where my co-host Daniel and I talk about movie news or newsworthy topics from the previous month. For February 2020, Daniel and I decided to talk about a hodgepodge of topics. In fact, this might be our most loose and casual episode to date. For starters, what begins as a discussion of Bob Iger's recent choice to step down as CEO of Disney goes straight into a discussion on the coronavirus and how COVID-19 has been affecting the film industry at large. Then we swing headfirst into a discussion over Disney+. Plus. For the foreseeable future, Bob Iger will oversee Disney Plus's development. And to put things in perspective, Daniel and I discuss our experience with Disney+, Plus, how it's fought to differentiate itself from the competition, and what sort of changes may happen in the months to come. We also take some time to discuss a potential writer's strike that may hit the film industry in the near future, and look back to the writer's strike of 2007 for some guidance on what we expect from the industry as a whole during 2020. And finally, because I've been bugging Daniel about it for so long, we're going to talk about Quibi. What's Quibi, you might ask? Just the strangest upcoming streaming service you've never heard of and we're here to tell you about its bizarrely fascinating mission to be the most interesting yet miscalculated app to join the streaming wars. If you enjoy the show, be sure to check out Cinematic Doctrine's other offerings like Trailer Talk and our regular movie reviews. You can also leave a review on your respective podcast app to show your support, or go one step further and consider supporting the show via Patreon. For as little as $3 a month, you can influence the show by choosing a movie we review at the end of each month. Not only that, Daniel and I will be including a pre-show recording exclusive to supporters on Patreon. When Daniel and I get ready to record, we often discuss a few topics ahead of time to solidify what we want to cover in each episode, or catch up with one another. After about 30 minutes of movies, Christianity, and life itself, we often realize that a lot of what we discuss would make for great content, whether movie-related or Christian-related. So from here on out, we'll be releasing a Patreon-exclusive podcast called The Sin Doc Pre-Show. This will be a once-a-month casual offering exclusive to Patreon supporters of the podcast, and it will be available for everyone who supports Cinematic Doctrine through Patreon. You can also keep up with us on social media through Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We also have a great Facebook group where you can join the conversation with other like-minded Christian movie fans. All of this will be available in the show notes. Also, just an update on monthly movie news as a whole, Daniel and I are looking to change the format of this particular offering of Cinematic Doctrine. By next month, we're looking to implement a new structure that not only lightens the load for us, but also introduces you, the listener, into the fold. For next month's monthly movie news, Daniel and I will each bring one topic to the table and allow for a third topic at the end to be decided by you, our lovely fans. We will either discuss a master topic or simply run with a mailbag and cover multiple topics swiftly. It's open-ended, and available for everyone who follows our social media. We think approaching a more casual yet inclusive format will be of more benefit for all parties involved, so we hope you take advantage of this new opportunity to have your voice heard. Now to make sure that happens, you'll want to follow us on our social media. You already heard, but we're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. From there, we'll create a post for anyone to comment and share their thoughts on any movie-related topic, and we'll handpick a few comments to read aloud in the episode. We'll include your name or internet handle, as long as it's appropriate, so that you get the express joy of knowing you've made it on the podcast. 
Also, yes, we know, we're late to record and release. It was all Daniel's fault. Please forgive him. But anyways, without further ado, let's dig into the news. I'm sorry, people. This this one's on me. Don't blame Melvin. This one's on me. I, I had personal things and wasn't feeling well and all that stuff. So, But we're here now. We made it. We made it. We survived. We have survived the great apocalyptic 2020 where there's an election and there's horrible diseases going around and natural disasters. And uh, apparently Bob Iger is stepping down. You just mentioned Corona, and one of the rumors is that he stepped down so then he didn't have to deal with the corporate response to coronavirus. Is that really a rumor? There is a rumor that, like, so, I mean, Mulan is the next big release, and it's supposed to be, like, <laughs> it's they're trying to hit the Chinese market with Mulan, but this whole thing's going on. And, like, okay, so China's coming back from it. Like, they're definitely... I mean, things are recovering for them, but like one of the big rumors was like he decided to step down a little early because then he didn't have to be responsible or at least take on a ton of responsibility because the movies won't be doing so well because no one wants to go see a movie. Who 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 is it? Who is stating these rumors, though? I mean, I'm not saying that's a like completely improbable premise. No, sure, sure. So I sometimes listen to a YouTube program called Midnight's Edge. I listen to Midnight's Edge because they have really good pieces on long form topics. So they did great reporting during the Sony hack, the Sony email hack. And you learned a lot of really strange information about what they thought about Spider-Man and what they thought about Ghostbusters because of that. But they in particular brought up one rumor that was floating around that like that Bob Iger stepped down because he didn't have to deal with the corona stuff. That is just fun to think, but I don't think it's true. <laughs> I think he's just tired and wants to move on to the next thing. I mean, that's it is interesting timing, and I will say that early we did an episode about Birds of Prey and I was just reading people's views on like why the opening wasn't that great and why the end box office ended up not being that great. And a few people were some of the I saw some early people saying that, well, if you look at the general numbers, all box office is kind of down and they were speculating that it's partially because of the coronavirus, which is specifically a disease as transmittable through going outside and touching people. And a few people I saw were like, bah, that's not a, that's not a thing. And I think now weeks later, we see that maybe the coronavirus is playing more into the box office numbers than we'd expect. I know that I personally and I'm neither somebody who buys into big mass pandemic and i also love going to the movies have had second thoughts of going like maybe do i really want to go out in public and literally sit in a dark room in a chair that other people have sat in and touch the seats and put my hand on the armrest and all that stuff especially with a reclining chair where someone could have just fallen asleep and drooled all over it yeah i mean it's like i think it's wise to be a little cautious about when to go so like i like I already like going to the movies during the week, especially on a Monday because nobody's there and it's just comfy, but you do miss out on the the pack theater experience. But at the very least, it's clean and nobody's yeah. there. <laughs> so, but there's also the fact too that like I might not get sick from corona because it's not really affecting young people, but I interact with older people. So, right. I don't want to transfer it as a carrier to somebody who literally will die from this thing. So, it's something knowing like I work at my church and old people go to my church. I want to make sure that it's safe for them. So uh, if that means not going to the movie theaters where some big guy who's just dry coughing and stuffing popcorn in his mouth is, is going to go in and he's a carrier, then like maybe I shouldn't go to. <laughs> and I, I I work with people who have compromised immune systems. So that's something I also think, I also think about. Yeah. So, I mean, wrapping up that particular discussion – Wash your hands, especially if you go to the theater. Just drench your chair in, in disinfectant. And also ask the question why you didn't already own hand sanitizer. I have hand sanitizer on my desk. Like, literally, I'm looking at it right now. I have it in my car. <laughs> why are people running out and going, I don't have soap? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> you just wash your hand with, like, cold water, you heathens? Yeah, one of the big things I'm seeing is a large number of women on Twitter are just, like, mystified that suddenly all these men are like talking about hand washing and they're like 
wait a minute, were you guys not washing your hands previous to this? And the sad answer is most men are not. They, I, I am a man. I have been in public bathrooms with men. They just, you know, they sometimes they'll stop and they'll like fix their hair and then they'll just walk out of the restroom. They'll fix their hair after they shake it twice and get a little dribble on their hand with their unwashed <laughs> yeah, hands. It's, like, it's disgusting. Oh man, it's so gross. Men, men are men are men are typically gross in this area. I'm not gonna lie. I will say that one of the unexpected benefits of working in a hospital, as I have just all this endless access to things like toilet paper, toothbrushes, and just hand sanitizer of all the hand sanitizer I could ever want. Like I could just walk home with tubs of this stuff if I wanted to, which I've never, I don't use hand sanitizer. I don't, I, I find the concept of hand sanitizer kind of weird. It's kind of how we get super viruses. And if you want to know where MRSA came from, it's kind of where it came from. I'm not a doctor, but the, basically the constant use of these things, germs and things, those things also evolve along with everything else. So I don't know. I'm, I'm wary of hand sanitizer, but I've been using, I've been washing my hands a lot. Not that that's what people come to this podcast for, is to learn my hand washing habits. But you can't not talk about coronavirus. When, it's when you, coronavirus when you're is just talking yeah. to people. <laughs> this is a new show, and coronavirus is a thing that like Coachella just got canceled, South by Southwest got canceled, which in itself is a big story. Yeah, especially for movies. Yeah, a lot of independent filmmakers, a lot of smaller people, that's what they rely on to get distribution. And the fact that that's been axed is just humongously like, I mean, in the big picture sense, the big tragedy of 2020 will not be that somebody's like indie, like slow burn horror film didn't get picked up for distribution. <laughs> It'll be that people have died from horrible disease and the way this is affecting like world politics and the way nations talk to each other and the ramifications of putting like this particular administration in charge of things, good or bad will have long lasting effects as opposed to somebody's <laughs> movie not getting seen but like it does affect the industry and i was seeing things where like there are people who already bought non-refundable tickets like to and from um south by southwest and so i was seeing things like c robert cargyle the writer of uh, dr strange and whatever the next scott derrickson picture will be was offering to let people like stay at his house and like hang out if they're just going to be in town um <laughs> which is a cool which is cool of him but and now coachella has been delayed much to elon musk's delight because elon musk was tweeting about how much he hates coachella <laughs> earlier yesterday so i'm sure he's happy well we should just like we should just buy tickets and go hang out with that guy because fl- plane tickets are like 30 bucks yeah <laughs> it's like we're not going to catch the, the coronavirus so we might as well go travel while we can afford it <laughs> i mean we could i mean i'm not immune to coronavirus <laughs> per se <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's it is the unavoidable thing. Or if you want to talk about what's going on in the world right now, you're talking about the election. You're talking about whether or not you think Elizabeth Warren is going to endorse Bernie or Joe Biden, and you're going to be talking about how the coronavirus is affecting all aspects of the entertainment industry. Whether it's people not going to theaters because they understand we don't want to go out in public and sit in a dark theater with people and just hear coughing in the darkness, or whether or not like a whole general like a whole year's worth of productions are just not going to end up anywhere or they're just going to get dumped on on demand or streaming somewhere with no fanfare because they just didn't get picked up for distribution but new mutants that's going to make it <laughs> <laughs> of all things well someone made a blood pact with some dark mysterious force they didn't understand in order to get that movie like distributed <laughs> somehow so it, like all of Hollywood could get wiped out by the super coronavirus for all we know. And new mutants would still somehow end up in my queue on Hulu or, or whatever. But I mean, for, first and foremost, Bob Iger um, is not stepping away from Disney entirely. He is stepping down to the role of executive chairman. And the idea is that he, Iger is going to focus on more creative type ventures uh, because certainly someone like him, while they may, may tire of the quote unquote business side of the business, he may still want to be involved in, creative endeavors overseeing projects whatever whatever that means i mean sometimes roles like this because they don't get final say end up kind of being almost like creative consultant jobs as opposed to getting the end be the end all be all but one of the interesting things that i think is relevant to us outside of the coronavirus is that he's one of the things that's talked about is he his one of his plans is he quote unquote wants to streamline disney plus which is one of those sort of nebulous, meaningless sentences that can <laughs> mean anything and nothing at the same time. Like, what does that mean? He wants to stream on Disney Plus. It's the equivalent of watching a commercial on YouTube where 
literally put any Silicon Valley guy standing in, in the green room saying, we wanted to give the users the best experience they've ever had. <laughs> and you're like, what does any of this mean, dude? Just tell me what your product is. I'm going to skip the ad anyway. Yeah. And was your plan not to do that? Like we wanted to confound users as much as possible. Just really throw a wrench in a daily routine. Like obviously you want to give your product is going to be the best product that ever existed your product whatever it may be is going to revolutionize the way we do the product and how i experience the product or whatever but to be fair to bob Iger in this instance disney plus has had sort of an interesting launch and i do think one of one of our earliest movie monthly movie news episodes was just talking about disney plus in general i think the the service had been up for maybe a month by the time we did that episode and so in a way this is kind of a good way to sort of check in in the post Mandalorian era of Disney Plus and see where we're at with it. Because Disney Plus has had some odd, interesting, I guess you say mishaps, but but I would say more like misfires, where several of the announced properties and shows just got mysteriously axed for the always ever present quote unquote creative differences. You had Muppets Live Another Day, which I was actually really interested in as it was coming from like Adam Horowitz and Josh Gad was involved and that was canceled for again creative differences uh the Disney villains drama book of enchantment was canceled there was supposed to be a Tron project which just never materialized which is funny because I was just thinking about Tron the other day about how Tron is a, a property that I feel like is ripe for constant reinvention I'm sort of fascinated with tron as a property as something that everyone is familiar with i constantly see people wearing tron merchandise well not constantly but whenever whenever you go to like a nerd space whether it's you're going to your local comic book shop or a comic convention you're going to see somebody with a tron shirt and of course we all remember tron guy the legendary early internet meme but for whatever reason tron as a thing that ex- produces actual things you can watch it is rather short so apparently there was something at disney plus that just didn't happen. And then there's like other shows just get have gotten moved to Hulu, like High Fidelity or Love, Simon, which were moved because of the thing that we talked about where people weren't sure if that was a quote unquote appropriate for Disney+. Plus. And the thing that really made me want to talk about this story was the recent thing with the Lizzie McGuire show. Do you remember this? Yeah. And this this was probably the thing that I was most interested in as far as talking disney plus is concerned basically lizzie mcguire is not a television show that i watched <laughs> growing up i i can't remember if it was just purely because i was in a weird age where i was either a little too old or a little too young to see lizzie mcguire i don't quite clearly i don't remember much about but lizzie mcguire is a show just about tackling like in an honest real way the struggles of girls you know a girl growing up in middle school and high school which are as we all know can be very difficult times and so the idea of bringing back Lizzie McGuire, where that same audience can then watch a show where they then see themselves in an older Lizzie who's now in her 30s and then dealing with the honest struggles of that age is, a, is an interesting pro- proposition because certainly th- there are a lot of things that women go through every day that I think would be that are ripe for discussion and exploring in a narrative medium that's what most sitcoms were that's what sex in the city did and was so revolutionary this time why that show took off so massively is because he was dealing with quote-unquote women's issues in a very honest way but also you have that that good sweet spot of it's a nostalgic property that people want and people remember fondly even if you don't necessarily want to go back and watch those shows again but if you're going to reinvent the show and bring it back where you have a nostalgia where you could even still like, I mean, even now I'm thinking about it. Like what if you had like Lizzie still has her like mind surrogate character where she sort of has that external monologue via the drawn character, but now it's an older drawn character or even keep it like a younger character where it's almost like her inner child is talking to her. I mean, there's a lot you could do with this, but because of the, the issues and topics they want to talk about, because get surprise, surprise, the struggles of a 30 year old woman and the struggles of a 15 year old woman are very, very different Apparently, Disney, for whatever reason, this is just what we're hearing via the showrunner and Hillary Duff herself. They weren't comfortable with the what we are not specified, but apparently they want to deal with more mature adult subject matter, understandably. And so they just were like, nah, nah, and they didn't want to do that. So then the show just got canceled entirely, though Hillary Duff and her team are, are arguing and asking to be moved to Hulu because they want to keep the integrity of the show. 
And I always appreciate when somebody, Hilary Duff as a celebrity is someone that I've always, I wouldn't say admired because that would in, s- suggest that I followed her career in any way. But the thing Hilary Duff at my age now is known for is being one of the only child stars to grow up and not have any big blow up or some weird thing. Like we didn't turn her, turn on TMZ and see her like as a drunken wreck or at the scene of some sort of crime. Hilary Duff kind of grew up and just did her own thing, but also seeing that she has a sense of integrity for her own prop project. Like these are characters she cares about. And so she wanted to like maintain the integrity and honesty of the show. And Disney just didn't want to do that. And the whole thing sort of begs the question. And it's a question that we asked early on and apparently one that they haven't figured out now. And now Bob Iger is going to spearhead, which is what is Disney plus? What is the goal and aim of the service where there is now a strange sort of dearth of content where even now, and this is what you and I are probably going to talk about more than anything, what is on this service? Like, what do we want to watch? And especially in a crowded marketplace of streaming services, where if I want to watch something, there's tons of other places that I could go to to watch something. Why should I pick Disney Plus, especially when Disney Plus is at this weird juncture where they're simultaneously trying to be this global prod- like property that everyone can enjoy but which means that you can't include any content that would offend any sensibility, but the world's a big place and lots of people have different views and what is and is not okay. And Disney plus is also trying to be a family like service, but like a large part of their audience is people in our age group who love Disney, but we love Disney like in the way that you look back fondly in your childhood. But also like when you think about what current Disney product, like toy stories three and four, one of the things that people loved about them is that these are the same characters, but it's like the characters grew up with this audience. And that's what Hillary Duff want to do with Lizzie McGuire. Like I want a Lizzie McGuire that has grown up with her audience and now they can turn on and we can pick up back up right where we left off where Lizzie is still the person you can look on screen and a girl can see herself in Lizzie and see her overcome the same difficulties that she is going through. But now the difficulty isn't, oh boy you have a crush at school the difficulty is like workplace sexism or like difficulties using like dating apps or something i mean these are all things i'm speculating but it's hard to picture at least mcguire show that doesn't include these things so melvin with all of these things in mind i mean we did the episode earlier we talked about our thoughts and we had a lot of fears and trepidations about disney plus where it seemed like a really big glossy package that maybe when you open up there really wasn't much inside there was the shaggy dog 1950s and not a lot of original content that i was interested <laughs> That's in right i forgot about the shaggy dog <laughs> which has given us a great gif of just a dog clearly a guy in a dog suit punching a guy in the face which is like the it's like the incredible bulk yes <laughs> <laughs> when he turns into a person for a second and you're like what's happening and it's just a guy a bald guy with purple <laughs> yes. paint on his head if you have not seen the amazing bulk don't <laughs> but maybe look up a youtube <laughs> yeah, highlight no. of it <laughs> I mean, as we as we, as we, as we're talking, there's roughly 50 original movies and 50 original shows in production right now. So there's a lot of promise with Disney Plus. Like, there's all this content on the horizon. There's the MCU shows that they're going to announce. There is, um, in theory, a lot of great shows that are coming our way. But then we also see a lot of other previously announced shows have already been axed because of the dreaded creative creative differences. So I mean, looking back now and seeing where we were and where we're at, Melvin. Like, what are your current thoughts on Disney Plus as a service? Do you think Bob Iger should be able to fix this problem? I mean, like, what what are you thinking? Well, I remember the I I didn't remember the term at first. I think I said that in one of the episodes, but I remember the phrase that you used when we were talking about Disney Plus the first time, and it was deceptively shallow. Yeah, you really, you really didn't know how much content you had until you got it, and then you realized wow, there's hundreds of shows, but nothing to watch. And it's not the equivalent of opening your fridge and going all of this food and nothing to eat. It's literally, there's nothing there. It's more like, so So one of the reasons, Dan, we, we almost could have uh, postponed this episode was because he had food poisoning. Yeah, And it was a situation where he looks in the fridge and it's like, I'll just eat that. And I feel like that's Disney Plus. <laughs> Yeah, we sold Thai food. Yeah. Yeah, it's stuff that you liked before. It's been sitting there for so long. You put the show on and you go, oh, oh, no. And that's 
I mean, I did that. I joked about how I wanted to watch Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, and then I put it on, and I was like, can we slow down? I can't handle how fast this is going. And there was like three different plot lines in the first episode, and I was just so lost. And then I was like, that was that was the nail in the coffin for me, where I was like, okay, this service has nothing to watch. The Mandalorian's over, and we're not getting a new season until like, I think, winter of this year. I think they finished shooting. I think they wrapped up production and they're going into post now but but i mean why would i pay for a service that long so i've canceled (laughs) i I don't have disney plus anymore because there's nothing to watch and i'm not gonna put money into something i'm not gonna use and before we got started i i wanted to write out something and basically take a look at what we're paying like how much we're paying for when you're trying to watch everything or trying to cover all these streaming services because they deceive you into thinking they're cheaper because you're paying what like six bucks for hundreds and hundreds of stuff it, but that's like buying a 15 dollars package with your cable company that's giving you 300 channels of episodes and shows you can't watch anyway and so i had put together with netflix hulu disney plus hbo prime espn and cbs and i didn't include app include apple or anything else because nobody cares about those <laughs> but um and even niche services like shutter i didn't include but i chose those because those are pretty much what everybody's going for cbs all access i kind of felt like i wasn't going to include it's the kid you pick last in the gym in gym class um <laughs> is what i'm saying but you gotta he's okay. still there so you gotta <laughs> you know include him in roll call anyways i put these all together to kind of put in perspective like the cost and at their cheapest if you had all of these, Netflix, Hulu, Disney+, Plus, HBO, Prime, ESPN, and CBS, at the cheapest, that's $61. And at their most expensive, that's $94. Now, I didn't include, like, if you buy a year a year premium plan. I just included their monthlies. But that's a lot of money for stuff, like, you might not even be watching. So, like, Disney+, Plus is $7. Like, I'm not watching anything. Why am I going to pay $7 recurringly for that? I mean, there's nothing to watch. I'm not going to rewatch The Mandalorian again. I'll may- I don't even know if I'd rewatch it again in prep for season two. I don't really rewatch things now that I think about it, unless it's something that really connects with me or is really worthwhile, because I don't have the time for that. I use Netflix, so I wouldn't get rid of that. I don't really use Hulu, so I don't pay for that. And I get it with Spotify, but I get the ad version, so I'm not going to use it anyway. (laughs) Uh, I don't have HBO. I I have Prime, but that's like a bonus. One of the things about Prime that's really great is you're probably getting Amazon Prime for the mailing, and then you just get all these movies extra. So that's cool. ESPN, I don't watch sports, and CBS All Access is just a dumpster fire. So why would I have all of these things? And the reason I say all of that in regards to streaming is because why, what, what is Disney plus bringing to the table? Right. Nothing. There's, they're bringing nothing to the table. If you really enjoy these Disney products, then that's really good. And that's really great. But I feel like people might not be using it as much as they are. And if they are, then that's really good. You should keep it then. But I don't know. It's just really strange to me. So as far as like, all of this like plans like if bob Iger wants to do more creative which is really just hey you were able to build up marvel and you were able to build up disney animation and you were able to build up pixar and everything and you kind of drop the ball on star wars and he says he dropped the ball on that which isn't really true i mean he's the guy who hires people and lets them do their thing but for him to be like okay i'm just going to focus specifically on disney plus it'll probably work out well But why would I pay $7 a month for the promise that it's going to work out later? Especially when you think about movies and and shows and stuff can take upwards of a year to two years to produce. Why would I jump between a year or two years of a service that's not going to have anything worthwhile watching? That doesn't sound wise. That sounds like a waste of money that I can use for something else. $7 is a really, really, really cheap date I can go out with my wife. And that's really precious and cute because it's awesome to just go out and do stuff like that. But why would I spend $7 for something I'm not going to use? I also canceled my Disney plus subscription. I, I mean, part of the reason was that I switched phone plans and the new phone plan I had offered me free Hulu. And so I just like crunched the numbers and I just realized that I hadn't opened up Disney plus in months. Basically the moment the final episode of the Mandalorian dropped after I watched it, that was it. And I just had no reason to revisit the service, you know, especially, I mean, I'm in, I'm just in a place and I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this where I'm 
budgeting and I'm trying I'm like I just don't have tons of like disposable income to burn on even like a recurring cost of as little as seven to fourteen dollars a month. That's just too much. And this isn't the first streaming service that I've canceled for that sort of reason. But the thing that worries me about Disney Plus as a creative thing, and I, I've spoken about my issue my issues with streaming as a whole and my preference for physical media and all that stuff. But looking at the reasons that these Disney Plus shows were canceled, like again, the reasons are vague, but it was like Book of Enchantment was canceled because it was quote, the tone was too dark. And like the the dreaded adult content Lizzie McGuire, the reissue is that the first episode deals with someone cheating. And that was considered too risque for the service. And when you're getting to the point where those things are considered too edgy for your service, I, that that makes me worried. Especially when you have The Simpsons on your yeah. service. I just don't understand why The Simpsons is on Disney+. Plus. It makes no sense to me. It's this thing where, for instance, the Fast and the Furious franchise gets away with a lot of content and it gets a PG-13 rating because it's it's considered really profitable. So that gets a pass. And so it's this weird thing where, like, I'm sure that the MCU shows are going to have a much, you know, looser leash than the other properties because those are proven moneymakers and people have already bought into those products. Like, people already have bought into The Simpsons, so they don't have to worry about selling it to a new audience where the global brands of those things, I'm guessing, supersede what might be some cultural issues or even just the quote-unquote image of the service. As edgy as The Simpsons can be, it is a vener- venerated, venerable American franchise that many people look back fondly on. It's been around for 30 years now. So, yeah, the, that weird bipolar tonal shift of Disney Plus is certainly something to, to behold. But the whole thing with streaming is you're promised this thing of like the, the big thing with at, like Apple Plus was really pushing this with their ads where this is a creator driven service where because we don't have this strict like we don't have to worry about the FCC, we don't have to worry about ratings, quote unquote. You know, Netflix can do whatever they want. HBO and their service can do whatever they want. There's supposed to be this unbridled creativity where, and the idea is that there might be sort of an arms race for content, which is something we're going to get into in a little bit, where because these services just need content, like now the gates are open for all these creatives to come out of the dark and make all these interesting things because like Hulu and Netflix just need shows. They need something to sell people on. And Disney isn't offering that. And if I'm sacrificing, if we're going to, on the, all this altar, put the death of physical media, the death of DVDs and Blu-rays, I want something in return for this sacrifice, where if I'm not going to be able to buy my movies and DVD anymore, if I'm not going to be able to just go to a used video store in 20 years and just find a, like a used copy of a movie I want to see for five bucks, if I'm going to have to spend $20 a month on your service or whatever, I want to get something back in return for that. And Disney's, what I'm worried is that Disney's going to be the heartbringer of this thing where now you're getting like streaming services purely through the lens of safe investment. Where if Disney's going to put up all this money for the service, they don't want to do anything that might jeopardize all those precious subscribers, especially when in their mind, their subscriber base is parents with children or children themselves. And that's what worries me is that like I'm, I'm canceling. You've canceled because there just isn't anything there. But is the Disney brand big enough where they don't need it? Do they just not need to make anything <laughs> worthwhile? Because of the promises, six months from now, the new Marvel movie is going to come out. Or like I know the the last season of the Clone Wars cartoon came out. And are they going to be able to glide on these brand names so much that they don't have to worry about making anything of value? And I can hear somebody who, who just turned off their, you know, they're listening to Chapo Trap House and they just turned it off to listen to us because apparently we're on that same wavelength of, and I, I'm not app, and I'm not, I'm not saying I'm anti capitalist or whatever, but there is something to be said for this worry of like, is this thing too big to fail? Where do you want the Disney thing? Oh, yeah, I love Disney. And so they don't have to worry about making anything anymore. Like, does the name sell? It's a similar thing with, um, believe it or not, the WWE where they have such they have so many like distribution deals worldwide and they're making so much money from these other revenue services that they're having the WWE has record low ratings lower ratings than when the industry was quote unquote at its lowest back in like 1995 or whatever but they're it's financially so foolproof that they don't have to worry about if anyone's even watching the show anymore is that where Disney's at where they're so financially solvent 
where they can they they can just have to they just have to make Avengers five, which will make three billion dollars, where they can just throw all this other money at other things. Have to worry about. I don't know. That's what I'm more worried about. I don't know if Bob Iger is going to be up to the task. Well, you're talking specifically about one of the 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 end failure of of capitalism, and now I'll be the one to be anti capitalist here. But um, <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> but the the idea. I mean, any sort of human government, because capitalism is a form of government. A corporate company has enough power to influence hundreds, if not thousands, if not millions of people. That's like a pseudo government. The end product of human governments is always something really bad. And the fact that the pursuit of capitalism is efficiency, so getting the reward for the least amount of work, you're, you're right. There is no reason for Disney really to try because everyone's just going to get the stuff anyway. And that's why we have something like The Rise of Skywalker, where it was a movie that was going to have some sort of director's imprint on it, which was then completely deconstructed from a three hour epic that probably would have been kind of fine to a two hour, 20 minute Frankenstein monster because Disney went, well, it doesn't really matter what, what all it's good. People are going to go see this anyway. All we have to do is tell them that this is the thing that's going to be the climax to the thing that they saw when, when they were a baby in 1970 and they're going to buy the ticket. It does not matter. And that's gross because things like that do matter. It's when you make them not matter that it's like instead of enjoying the beauty of flowers, you're capitalizing on it for profit. And that's like a very weird thing to do, especially in, in an artistic field where you're going, it doesn't really matter that it's so cool that people can create complex things that imitate real life or express how this person sees the world. What we care about is that at least it's just going to make enough money to let us do the next thing that makes more money. So I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't I don't really like joining the bandwagon of not liking Disney because they're a corporation, because it's just such a tired and boring thing. Yeah. But it's tired and boring because everyone kind of knows it. You just either turn your head away and just watch Disney Plus shows anyway, or you genuinely like it. And if you do, that's, that's cool too. I, I'm not really taking that away from you, but I just don't know if like where I sit, I'm okay with that. Especially as someone who likes movies, not Disney. I like stories, not Disney. That's why if Disney puts out something that's good, I enjoy it. It's not because of Disney. It's probably because they had someone in the background who actually knew how to write a story or execute good pacing or, take characters like the guardians of the galaxy, which were even niche for comics t and make them into a household name. Disney plus is a very fascinating th thing for me to witness because I think it, it's less so much about what the service is actually offers and more about what the service is. But I mean, how much more can I talk about it? I don't even yeah. have it. <laughs> like <laughs> I, I, my, my care is at its minimum. But I guess I still have a lot to say about it, so I don't know what to think. <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting because when like I remember when, and I hate saying I remember because it makes me seem old, but I remember I remember both when Netflix was becoming a thing and when Hulu was becoming a thing, and both services began to take off because they had a specific thing offered. Netflix was offering a massive library of content, and Hulu was the one where you would see like after a show would air on TV the next day, that episode would be up on the service and you might and it might have ads or whatever and so like both of them had it offered a thing where netflix had a back catalog it was almost like netflix was like going to a library where hulu was like a legal way to watch that show that you couldn't watch last night because you had work or you're out with friends or something and so like both the services started blowing up because they actually offered a thing that was appealing and Amazon Prime is interesting because it's like, okay, like you get really fast shipping and you can see the Marvel's Miss Maisel. <laughs> so like, okay, that sounds cool. And the Disney Plus was was sold entirely on logos. It was just, you like Disney, you like Star Wars, you like Marvel, don't you? You like these things, don't you? And you're like, I do like those things. And so- And then you look over to the side and you're like, I like National Geographic. <laughs> <laughs> i think i do now if disney's giving it to me <laughs> i'm smart i put nat geo in my queue <laughs> i'll get to that someday i'll watch that show where that doctor helps animals or whatever 
My 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 mother in law loves those shows. I love them too. I just don't want to have Disney Plus to watch them. <laughs> I can walk go on Netflix and watch documentaries about animals. I don't need Disney Plus to do that. I I mean I will say one more thing, and this is something that again talking about like how one of my issues like to 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 put a cap on this particular part of this discussion is i think a lot of people think about streaming wrong like i think in disney plus was the thing that really solidified this for me where when we think of streaming i think in our minds what what we visualize is now that i've paid them some money i have access to a giant vault of content like i'm walking into the library of alexandria i could walk in and pick a movie or a show off a shelf when in reality that's not what streaming is at all streaming is you're paying like it's the same thing as paying your rent every month but it's for the rights to view whatever content Disney feels like you you are allowed to see at that time. Because we talked about this where we open up the service and there's like 50 to 100 things that say this will be available at this time. Or you have to wait a couple of months because the rights to this aren't like cleared up yet with this other people. And then now we have things where like the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air is on Netflix in Europe or Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is on Disney Plus in Europe. Or Uncut Gems is <laughs> on Netflix in Europe. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, and there was a thing where like it was simultaneously announced that Studio Ghibli films would be on the HBO service and it was announced that Studio Ghibli films would be on Netflix. And I remember people getting really confused about that on social media because it was like a different thing where and I remember like now like everyone's so becoming so diversified. Everyone's now hoarding their properties because they're trying to launch their own services where it's just becoming a mess where DC stuff is now, now like spread across three different services where it's like Smallville is on Hulu, Disney DC has some originals on their Warner Bros. DC streaming app, and now they're also going to be putting things on HBO. Where if you're a DC fan, if you want to see everything, you have to subscribe to like four or five different services just to see all of one thing now. And that that to me is the real like we're just inventing cable again thing, which I know isn't I'm not the first person to say that, but it really is killing the entire appeal and potential of a streaming service to me where the idea was like we're going to end piracy and we're going to make things available to people because that's really what people want people don't pirate movies and tv shows just i'm sure it's someone like this but people just don't love stealing things they just wanted to watch their shows and so like we're going to make it where it's accessible to everyone and if anything it's going to help with film preservation where things aren't going to get lost anymore or now like someone started up a website where they're just posting tons of old vhs tapes on it did you see that? I think you sent it to me. I don't I don't think I had time to check it out at the time, but Yeah, it's like all those old VHS instructional videos and shot on video stuff that you'd see at your local video store or it would just mysteriously appear in your <laughs> closet somewhere where it's like learn how to hula hoop in thirty minutes or whatever. Like those just someone's archiving all of those. And that's what we wanted. But now I I'm I'm worried there's gonna be a whole generation of films and TV shows that are gonna get lost again. Because there's no money in putting on physical media anymore because nobody's buying it anymore. But then nobody's going to bother licensing the rights to it or whatever, because why would you do that? Well, that's like Community. What happened to season five of Community, right, was on Yahoo. And where where do you watch that? Do you watch it on Hulu? Where where does it go? (laughs) Yeah. Did it get moved to Hulu or Netflix? I don't know. I don't even know. I have no idea. (laughs) Yahoo was like, we're going to open a streaming services service. By the way, we're reviving Community with the original writers. And then, like, a year later, we're closing Yahoo Streaming. <laughs> You're like, okay, but what's happening to these shows you have? What was it? Like, there was CISO, and then, like, I think CISO's, all of their properties just got put up for auction. Where, like, Harmon Quest and the My Brother, My Brother and Me show got bought up by, like, I think VRV bought them or something, which is a service that I'm sure some of you have never heard of until right now when I said it. But we are not the only people affected by streaming services. There is, and then... I'm shocked this is not getting more coverage. Maybe it's because it's not as bad as it looks like it is. But Melvin, are you aware of the fact that there is a possible looming writer strike? Yeah. So there, I remember reading about this a couple years ago, not years ago, I guess like maybe last year, but recent, recent enough for me to remember, but not long enough for it to be like 2011. I mean, that was right after the last writer's strike, but yeah, basically there's like a, there's a different, way in which writers are paid for streaming sto- like series and and movies as opposed to cable television in theaters home video all that jazz in fact i think the last time there was a writer strike was because of home video i think they weren't making the the proper 
I don't know. If if you want to hear about this, go check out my Dr. Horribles episode because that was last year and that's when I did all this research. But but yeah, I think I remember hearing that like because of streaming services, that's that's up in arms again. Basically, and it, you know, the dawn of a new media means that suddenly all the rules are changing. The previous writer strike was about like writer's revenue, especially in contrast to studio profits, because isn't it always? Uh, this one is, I mean, the, the details are, I wouldn't say sparse, but these, these things get complicated. But for clarity's sake for everyone, the three-year contract that the Writers Guild has doesn't expire until May 1st. So there's still time that things might get hashed out. But the basic idea is revenue in regards to streaming services. I mean, how do you quantify that? Like, how do you get paid for royalties and residuals from television shows? Because it used to be like, you know, you get something would go into syndication, and you get based on syndication fees and royalties and all that. But like, how do you quantify that with something like a Netflix show that you worked on? So, I mean, that's, I mean, that's the basic bare bones thing is they're just currently negotiations in attempt to uh, figure this, figure this all out. Cause I mean, writers are kind of the underutilized, underappreciated workhorses of the industry. If you've watched any documentary or listened to anyone talk about a troubled production, at some point someone's going to mention that there were six or seven writers running around trying to make scenes work together. You know, my favorite, I, my two favorite stories of that are a on the Super Mario Brothers movie. Oh, God, I just blanked on his name, Dennis Hopper, the play who, right? That's the play King Koopa. Yes, yeah, that is. Yeah, Dennis King. Hopper got to the point where he stopped memorizing his lines because every day a writer would hand him a new script, so he just stopped blurting his lines. Or when Kevin Smith talks about working on Die Hard Four, he walked on set and just ended up writing a whole other scene. And there was he was told, "Don't worry about it. There's 20 other writers working on this movie right now." Because in addition to the writers that wrote the script, in addition to the writers that are on set working, Bruce Willis has his own personal team of writers who help him rewrite his movies. If you ever wondered, hey. Why does Bruce Willis act the same and seem like the same character in every movie? It's because he personally writes every movie he's on to be more in line with what he wants, which is Bruce Willis plays Bruce Willis. So yeah, the writers are always getting sort of the short end of the stick uh, in terms of just credit and like the whole issue of how you get credited as a writer on a thing is its own kind of like weird story. But uh, the thing that caught my eye about this story is that there's currently studios are just stockpiling and like buying up scripts and stuff and ordering more shows just to have a back catalog of content in case the writer's strike happens. Um, if anyone remembers anything back to the writer's strike from like 2007, that was a weird time for everyone where if you wonder why there was suddenly an influx of reality TV shows, that was why is because there was just this, they just needed an unscripted television in order to fill airtime because there just weren't writers around. And there was a weird thing where, uh, the best, one of the best examples of this is the movie. Uh, what was it called? Role models. Do you remember this movie? Role models with Paul Rudd and Sean William Scott. Oh man, that name sounds familiar, but right? probably just cause I've seen the poster. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, that's a just a random example is one I always, it sticks out to me because basically they had a script that they started with, but it was like unfinished because of the writer's strike. So most of the movie was entirely improvised by Paul Rudd and Sean William Scott and all the actors because there just wasn't a script. And if you part of it's part of why Action Order is Wolverine is so bad is because that movie went into production right when the writer's strike happened, where like the script literally said things like Deadpool walks in room, speaks fast and is funny. And that's all Ryan Reynolds had to go <laughs> off of. So that's like. That's so bad. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a lot of reasons that movie is bad, but. Part of it is that they just didn't have people that could write the movie. Um, so because of this, because of this experience, Hollywood is like trying to learn from their mistakes. And they're just like, OK, they're just ordering all these scripts and ordering all extra episodes of TV shows and stuff just so they have a stockpile of uh, content in case a strike happens. Uh, but the other side of the story that's kind of interesting to me is that these three things I'm talking about all to me go hand in hand because there's an overarching story that I think that we need to sort of talk about, which is just the death of live television, specifically live scripted television. If you want to watch a show, if you want to watch a satisfying narrative experience, if you want to really get swept up in characters and story arcs and these types of things, live TV just isn't the place to go to anymore where all these scripted shows are being ordered and bought up by streaming services. And it just doesn't seem like there's any sort of care for scripted television. The way I learned about the writer's strike was actually through a very weird way, which is 
Melvin, have you heard of MLW? MLW? No, I haven't. I'm not surprised you have. Uh, you have it. Most people haven't. It's it's that it's Major League Wrestling. It is a wrestling organization that is on BN Sports, which is a channel I don't think anyone who doesn't watch soccer has heard of, and they have a free YouTube show. However, they're recently in talks with Amazon and Paramount to get their show on the air. And I was just baffled by this because I was like, why in the world would people be ordering like a wrestling show that I watch because I'm a big wrestling fan? And if you turn on TV, there's a lot of wrestling on TV all of a sudden. There's all elite wrestling on TNT and they just got a second show ordered. WWE has four shows on. Now there's negotiations for MLW and there's negotiations with the NWA and Impact Wrestling just got signed to Access TV. And I don't know if you noticed, but the XFL is suddenly back. I'm, I mean, you said you don't watch sports, so I'm guessing you're not watching the other football league as well. <laughs> no, no, not at all. XFL is awesome in case anyone hasn't watched it. Like, with like, there's like multiple touchdowns. People are like, all the hits are legal in the NFL are allowed. It's a, it's a fun football show. I'm not even a big football fan. I've been checking it out. But the reason all these shows have suddenly been greenlit and I started looking into this is it's cheap, free live programming because that's the only thing people are going to even tuning in to watch anymore. We talked about this on a Golden Globe show. Why is the Golden Globes around? Part of it's because it's the only thing people will watch. People no longer are tuning in to live TV to watch scripted television. The only thing that they be willing to turn their actual archaic TVs on for what to watch is live event programming like sports, like professional wrestling, like football or award shows. My father-in-law was for a long time the only person I know who watched the Big Bang Theory Jeopardy Meal of Fortune because he just comes home and he turns the TV on, he sits down in his old chair and starts reading the newspaper and he just has TV on. And they just, within two weeks ago, finally cut the cord and the poor man is lost because he doesn't know what to do. Now they can't watch his Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune every night. So oh, now no. they're trying to show him, they're trying to show him, look, you should check out the Twilight Zone. It's on Netflix. <laughs> you can watch it here. And so he's trying to figure all that out. And so like between these, between these things, between like, so there's a big writer strike going on with streaming where now that's where, that's where the war is. People, writers are writing for streaming now. They're not writing for live TV anymore. I mean, this is a lot to throw on you, Melvin, but I mean, do you think we're sort of in the twilight years of the very concept of like live television shows where now people are ordering things like The Mass Singer or where the voice is in or what's it called? That show where people go and get their songs written by professional songwriters. I only know these things because of my in-laws, but like, are we officially in sort of like the death rows of live scripted television? Is Is all scripted television now like actual prestige television moving to streaming because of all the things you've talked about now. And is television just going to be a live sports delivery service? So I briefly mentioned the Dr. Horrible's thing, but I guess I'll just say what I remember from that. And so you should still go listen to it because you should, <laughs> cause I put work into that. Yeah, <laughs> but please. one of the things about uh, Dr. Horrible's is that it was a, one of the first extremely popular streamed shows because it was, right. it was Joss Whedon and company and they were just friends who did writing and they did all their own stuff because they would write for shows and write for movies and all that jazz and since they were on strike they still needed something to do so they were like well let's just make a three-part comedy musical and so they did and it was very popular it's very good totally recommend it it's got some really great music too but one of the purposes of it apart from being we're not working, we have money and we're bored. So let's do something with that is also because they wanted to show like, Hey, we don't actually need you big Hollywood or anybody to, to do what we're doing and do it well. And you can tell that like when Dr. Horrible hit it off, well, there was probably someone who was shaking their head who could have purchased and helped push that project out. And lost out on that talent, lost out on that opportunity. I just was talking about the, my irritation with capital, the end product of capitalism. And now here I am explaining to you that like some capitalistic guy was probably bummed out and he should have supported that project. But the point being, you almost saw exactly what we're seeing now where they were like, well, we'll just go to streaming. And that was very good foresight because uh, that's kind of the direction things are now. However, we are in a place now where they need to get a better deal for the fact that all of these shows are being put on Netflix. I recently posted in the Syndoc group about I am not okay with this. And I was like, what do you guys think about this show regarding what's in the show? What do you think about the performances and all the other stuff? But all that jazz, it was, it was a good 
uh, post and good conversation. But that was on streaming. And guess what? That was a show where the entire first season was just thrown on Netflix. It wasn't something weekly released. But that goes into a good part of this too. Where So we talked about live scripted television. And while we don't necessarily see live scripted television with streaming, because streaming is whenever you want, we are seeing Netflix and other programs transition to weekly release schedules. So you had that with The Mandalorian. Netflix has that with things like Terrace House and other stuff. Of course, Terrace House isn't scripted, but um, it's an example of weekly releases. Right. But um, there are some weekly release shows that are scripted that they're doing uh, in a weekly format because, I mean, it keeps people subscribed i mean we literally just talked about how disney plus we canceled because there's nothing to watch but you know if there was a show that was worth watching and it was releasing each week we would keep the service and that's probably about two three months of of our money so you are starting to see some shows not be live weekly released but they are getting weekly released nonetheless now as far as like the death of live weekly releases i mean that happened with the end of game of thrones and unfortunately game of thrones well maybe <laughs> maybe fortunately but game of thrones decided to not only be the last probably the last show that will ever be talked about to such a degree and weekly released it also decided to stab it in the heart multiple times by releasing <laughs> a very bad last season i mean this is a case let me just talk about this real quick i didn't watch the show but it's amazing to me that this well, the last season was so bad that nobody is talking about it anymore. I mean, people talked about Breaking Bad for a very long time afterward when it ended, and it was a good last season. But the point being, like, it was a good last season, and you still wanted to watch everything over again because you knew that where you were going was going to be worthwhile. But now the exact opposite has happened with Game of Thrones, and I feel bad for George R. R. Martin because he still has to finish his book, and there might not be as much value in it now because nobody cares. I think if he's smart, he's going to market it as the real ending of Game of Thrones. Probably because there were rumors going around the fact that like a lot of what was put into the, that ending was things he said he may use for an ending, but isn't sure yet. So at the very least he, he could go, well, I know what not to do with my book. Anyways, this isn't a Game of Thrones podcast and I haven't watched a single episode for my own reasons, but and, and probably reasons many other Christians have. So, so that's fair. But the point being, I mean, that was the last big show that like everybody was going to work and talking about. That was a live scripted show. Otherwise, when I would work at, at a school, like people would talk about, you know, I mean, not Kardashians in particular, but they would talk about non-scripted, which is probably not true. I'm sure they are scripted to some degree, but drama shows and stuff like that. Like you have your ice road truckers that your uncle can't stop watching and <laughs> uh, all that stuff. And that's cheaper to make. And for some reason it really works, even though we all kind of know these shows because we've seen YouTube clips of things that are really stupid from them. Like the, you remember the one, the watch your profanity. You ever yeah, see yeah. that? That's, like, that's how I know about that show. I don't know it because I don't watch it, but uh, what was that? It was a um, storage wars, right? Yeah, storage wars. Yeah. Like that's a show people where they just walk into like a storage place and they find it. I love how they parody that in Arrested Development where um, Job gets lost after a, a magic show and they find him in a storage thing and he's completely like he's just in a loincloth and all he's had to eat were twizzlers for three weeks <laughs> it was like so stupid <laughs> but it was shot like it was on a storage wars episode anyways that's what people are watching now they don't care about the next drama that's like a, a riveting show of of subtext and layers people just don't care about that if it's live television they're just gonna watch what's going on in this person's life who's rich or whatever. And at least on a moral sense, I'm not comfortable with that because a lot of those shows are kind of like what I talked about in the last monthly movie news, where it's people watching them to go, my life is better than theirs. I'm going to make fun of them and laugh at their misery. And that's not, that's, that's horrible. <laughs> that sounds terrible. I, it, all of this kind of bums me out, like the the transition to more live stuff. It's sort of like when you hear your your conservative friend who says, like, I don't watch any shows because they're all tailored to make their to push their agenda. Well, the agenda of these shows is whatever's the most entertaining. And what you know, what's entertaining is people gossiping and drama. And that's just unfortunate. And so to think that that's sort of the transition is it bums me out. I don't know. Maybe you, you think differently. I mean, sports doesn't function that way in particular, but sports has its own problematic issues. But I suppose everything does. 
Well, I just wait for the new earth, I guess, guys. Just when Christ returns, <laughs> we can, we'll see what's on the streaming services when Christ returns. Qu- quite the plan. Yeah. yeah. I can't wait to see what's on Netflix in heaven. <laughs> be, maybe uh, Dark Crystal Season 2. Ooh. I wouldn't mind that. Age of Age of Resistance Season 2. That's never going to happen. That's a whole lot. So uh, go ahead and deconstruct that, or we can talk about Quibi or Quibi or whatever you want to call it. But <laughs> oh, man, you really want to talk about Quibi. Dude, Quibi is like, it's, Quibi makes no sense to me, man. <laughs> you want to talk about streaming services? It makes no sense, but it makes so much sense, but it's not going to work out. Okay, before, before we get to that. <laughs> Teaser trailer. There you go, guys. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm hoping there isn't a, a I'm, obviously I hope the writer strike doesn't happen. I hope. I just hope everyone can reach a co- compromise that makes everyone happy, obviously. You're too hopeful, Dan. I know. <laughs> too hopeful. I hope whoever wins the presidency takes down the high places and we get Fridays off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's just no taxes. Uh... Everybody just supports each other equally. And chaos walking finally comes out. That's not going to happen. I want, <laughs> what I want is Silent Hills, the canceled Silent Hill game from... Hideo Kojima. I just want to play PT. I didn't get a PS4 until PT was taken off. But anyways, different podcast. We (laughs) we should move on. (laughs) But yeah, moving on from that. In a perfect world, in a a world where everything works out, this like exodus of writers and things to streaming and a focus on creating quality content streaming services in order to justify people paying money for a streaming service would be the antithesis to what we're talking about with Disney+. Plus where Disney would have to begin upping the quality of their content because nobody is watching television on television anymore. People are just watching sports and events on television. And so like, that's kind of what I would hope would happen where like Disney plus and the people in charge of that would look over and they'd see like all this prestige programming taking place on, you know, the HBO or CBS all access or crackle or who knows what else is, is being you know utilized. I mean, and to briefly touch upon the whole writer strike thing, I think people should be paid for their work. I think people should be paid fairly for their work. I do think it's exploitive if somebody, if I, there is something kind of off where you get in a situation where somebody had a hand in creating something like timeless. Like imagine if somebody had helped co-create like the Simpsons, for example, and they just got no credit for their work and didn't get paid for it. And that's happened in the past. There was a whole thing with... Um, yeah, Bob King and, and uh, Bill Finger. Yes, with Batman. Bob King and Bill Finger, which now people are recognizing Bill Finger as co-creator for Batman, but it's too late. <laughs> yeah. It's, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's a nice moral victory, but you know, you know, there's something sad about that where somebody can help create something that potentially could be timeless or affect people forever and ever. And then they're still eating like mayonnaise sandwiches at home because they don't have any money as a wrestling fan. I'm really happy to see all this wrestling get greenlit on TV. And I'm glad I get to watch more of it as somebody who likes television and movies. It's very sad that will potentially like end up back right back right back where we were with cable, but on streaming. Where now there's a limited number of services. There's only a limited number of pe- uh, projects that get greenlit every year because the number of television shows getting created goes down. Um, that's sadly what I hope does not happen. I don't know. I I just can't decide if I'd be sad if TV disappeared. That's the main thing I've been thinking about. Is will I be sad to see? the ritual of coming home after work or just like you have friends over and you just tur- flip the TV on and you start channel surfing to find something. Cause it's, that's just the same thing as the whole, like we missed the video store thing where there was a whole ritual to it. There was a whole event around seeing a movie where you, you, you know, go with some friends, you go to blockbuster, maybe you go with your family, maybe you go with friends on a Friday night, whatever. And you pick and you'd go through all this trouble of picking out a movie where you look at the back of the boxes and stuff and you pick out a snack or whatever. And then you'd like live or die what you watched. And that's what kind of birthed this whole like bad movie thing where everyone had this experience of laughing together at like a bad horror movie they picked out because they thought it'd be scary, but it's stupid. And that's also how this something like Mystery Science Theater 3000 got started, where it was initially something that was kind of on basic. Uh, it was a local access. And then later just getting this cult following because people was on was like flipping the channels late at night would just stumble upon this weird show. I think we still have all that, though. I mean, YouTube is the stumbling upon things. Redbox is the going out and getting the really crappy horror movie. I mean, my wife and I did that. Redbox is also dying, though. Which is so sad because I really (laughs) enjoy going to Redbox and getting stuff. Redbox just liquidated their entire video game stock. 
which was awesome because I just went around to different red boxes and buying like brand new games for like five dollars. I do. I remember the Reform Gamers group on Facebook was full of people just being like, "Yo, I got God of War for six bucks." Yeah, <laughs> you're like, yeah, who cares about the case anymore? That was the big thing is I you get this like sketchy like this like their use case and some of them like the discs inside were also like not in great condition. But yeah, I got a lot of Christmas shopping done that day. I mean, there is that element where you're just like mindlessly scrolling through the internet, and I, I get, but like I do think there is something to be said about. Um, I mean, I do we do tend to romanticize things like the idea of scrolling through like late night TV. Most of what you're getting is old infomercials and like pre Tim and Eric Tim and Eric content, basically. I think there there's some benefits to that too, though. I mean, when you're a kid and you're walking through Blockbuster and like you're awkwardly accidentally walk down the aisle where all the adult videos are. Like you don't have that happen anymore when you're scrolling Netflix. You do have that on the internet. <laughs> you do have it on the internet, which really sucks. But, and, and there are some things on Netflix that, sh- that really should not be there. Um, but because they're streaming, they're allowed to do whatever they want, which is such a shame. I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disagree here. I think that's far worse on the internet than I ever was. So you're right. Like... No, you're absolutely <laughs> right. I mean, Instagram is a nightmare to navigate. TikTok is TikTok is bizarre, and the fact that it just—it's like looking at the model at the to end of two thousand one. <laughs> like TikTok yeah. is just something else. It's it's just it's stupid. But when you're thinking of something like when I scroll Netflix to look for a movie, since the algorithm already knows what I like, it really doesn't put up anything that's highly inappropriate or or could be a temptation or something like that. You don't get that there. You don't get that with not having to go to Blockbuster. Um, you don't get that with not scrolling through channels. I have talked with men who struggle with fighting against lust and other things like that, where literally going home to just put on the television and flick through the channels. It's not even that they purchase the inappropriate channels. They just are flicking through or letting it run and something comes up. And I think, yeah, you can get that when you're on like Facebook and I'm not necessarily saying you can't get that when you're on your Netflix. Uh, I just think it's perhaps ironically, like you said, the internet's far worse and it's far easier, but it also is, I think when you know how to work these things, it's a lot easier, but you can say the same thing with Blockbuster. If you know which aisle has the adult videos, you don't walk down that aisle, (laughs) but I digress. I I was just trying to think of what's a positive, <laughs> and so that's what came to mind. <laughs> First off, one of the th- stories I want to talk about, but like there isn't much story to it, is did you hear that Movie Phone is being run by one sole employee? <laughs> yes, yeah. I wanted so to talk funny. about that so bad. I mean, I guess we could still cut it, but literally, it's just one person is running all of Movie Phone. That's awesome. If you call the number and you're not in the right region, it goes to like spam calls. So you literally called the number for a movie phone just to be registered in a spam number that's now going to call you like mad. What's funny <laughs> is that's because of what we talked about with Movie Pass. Like Movie Pass, I think, bought Movie Phone and then Movie Pass is like bank because the bankruptcy thing like they're bought out so there's just like this movie phone it still exists like as like a website or something and it's just like it's in limbo because it's kind of like owned by somebody who doesn't care about it because they're busy with like movie passes bankruptcy and so there's just like a lone guy just keeping the site running which is the funniest division <laughs> my head to me i just picture it's kind of like when you when you I, bojack horseman a whole thing where like in newspaper like if you they showed somebody's working in a newspaper and it's just like tons of empty cubicles and no one's there anymore <laughs> i just picture that with movie pass there's just a big office building with empty cubicles and one guy just throwing like balled up pieces of paper into a trash bin waiting for like someone to call the phone it's like i'm just here to make sure nobody steals these cubicle walls they costed a lot of money <laughs> yeah well can you think of like a more obsolete service than i could just google what time this movie is or i could call a phone number and go through a menu like especially when movie theaters if you call a movie theater they will read to you what showings are which is very (laughs) irritating when you actually have a question for the theater i remember wanting to go see a foreign film but i wanted to know if it was dubbed or subbed because the listing didn't say and i called up regal and it starts listing all the showings i'm like i'm i literally have to go there to ask so i just bought the ticket and i went and it was it was subbed so thank goodness but it was just so dumb like movie phone was obsolete the second the seinfeld episode came out so i don't know why <laughs> like i don't know why it existed for so long and the, the joke online is that the lone employee is kramer is what people are saying <laughs> but 
I yeah, I, I get that there's a there's a whole nostalgia thing where there's a lot of obvious advantages to the where, where the era we're living in where I don't need to channel surf, I can just queue up something on streaming or even just on demand or whatever or actually just like you said go to my queue nobody watches what you put on your list <laughs> you, you're like i'll put that in my queue i'll watch it later and then you just i ah, just watch the office again yeah it's like <laughs> ah. i'll get around to all these episodes of my next guest is with david letterman you know yeah which is a great show i highly recommend people watch it but I mean, yeah, I mean, there is a sense where like what you're pining for is more this lost experience. Like I, the, I've said this before, I don't know if on the show or just with friends, but my absolute jam would be if I could get two things, which are a G4 simulator where I could, I could like, I, cause there, there are websites that simulate TV. Like, I don't know if you've heard about the, like, there's a website I used to go to all the time where it was called like my nineties TV or my eighties TV the overlay is a old tube TV and you can, you can set the the date and the type of program you want. And you can just flip through imaginary channels and it uses like YouTube and stuff to pull up old commercials from like the eighties or old television shows from the eighties. It's really cool. That's a really cool college project. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure that guy got an A. <laughs> yeah. That's someone's, yeah. That's someone's final in media or whatever, but it's really neat. And I, what I want is something like that for G4 and adult swim where I could sit there and I could have the experience of like watching these channels with the commercials. Like I want to watch old episodes of not talk of this show, but X play and and cinema tech. And I want to watch like adult swim, but with the bumpers and the weird music and like the weird commercials that are actually just part of the programming and, you know, see things like C lab and Harvey Birdman. Like that's what I want. And you just don't get that experience with a streaming service. Like, and there isn't this experience of like, and you, I fall down a lot of YouTube rabbit holes. There's a lot of like things I'm sure I'll be nostalgic for when I'm 50 going like, man, I miss old YouTube, you know, or whatever. I'm, I'm already doing that a little bit. <laughs> remember when channel awesome wasn't scary. Yeah. <laughs> remember, I remember rating videos, five stars, you know? And like, I, I mean, there's already still that already does pine for that when YouTube wasn't like this overly corporatized thing where like all of your recommended videos were like talk show host clips and, joe rogan podcast or whatever like i just yeah i want to watch someone's weird home video that's two minutes long says nobody but deep down we kind of missed like the weird like no man's land this that was kind of youtube that's what i really am will miss about television is where because you didn't have full control of what you were watching you were subjected to all kinds of interesting weird things you otherwise wouldn't have a lot of movies that we look back fondly on are only fondly looked at because they're cheap to license and cheap to put on television. Like a Christmas story was a complete bomb when it came out in theater. Same with it's a wonderful life. And the only reason those movies are so fondly remembered is because people is would watch them because they would get played every year around like Christmas or Thanksgiving or whatever. And because they were cheap to syndicate. And that's the type of like, curated content that you won't get out of streaming where now it's like you said it's just this backed up queue of all these shows with no context and unless like a twitter follower you really a twitter account you really trust or a youtuber you watch or like a guy in a facebook group says like you should check this out you're never gonna watch it uh quibi so there's the streaming service that uh, corporations think is going to be a very big deal but nobody knows anything about there is one massively paid commercial for the Super Bowl that I'm sure nobody remembers and nobody knows what the context was it was just a it was the equivalent of we're trying to make a good user experience it is a nothing commercial that just shows other corporations that want to maybe invest or support that you know what you're doing even though no one actually believes that basically it is a streaming service specifically for phones and it's not a TikTok where it's an application that's all user based it is a literal streaming service so Netflixy or whatever stuff like that for your phones. It is five dollars with a an ad free version that will probably be about ten dollars. All speculation. I don't. I don't think they've come out with specific numbers. These are just guesses. And it is supported by BBC Studios, Disney, Fox, NBC Universal, Warner Media, Viacom. And now you can see that this is the one thing I prepared for this episode. <laughs> this is a so basically some big big people behind it. But the thing about this streaming service is that it is short form content. Episodes will be seven minutes, seven to 10 minutes. And there are unique ways in which you engage it. You can engage it in portrait mode. You can engage it in landscape mode. 
and portrait mode and landscape mode might introduce different things. Maybe landscape is a wider view, so you see things in the peripheral because you know every director in Hollywood knows that you can use your empty space for things, which is a joke, obviously. Some directors don't know that empty space can be perfectly used for your film. Point being, though, it's a very niche thing. You're using it on your phone only. You're watching high-quality content, probably. And people connected to it are Guillermo del Toro and Sam Raimi, who also are producing their own unique shorts. Del Toro apparently doing a modern-day zombie show because we need another one of those. And, well, if del Toro's doing it, it might be interesting. And Sam Raimi doing a project called 50 States of Fear. So they are probably gunning right for the political stuff in the beginning of their service. But again, yeah, it's it's kind of like TikTok. It's kind of like all of these other, like YouTube, I basically, because YouTube is short form content. Uh, but if you use YouTube like I do, then you use it like a podcasting app where I put it on, but then I put it in the other room and let it play while I'm doing something else. But it's such a niche specific, highly invested program that I just don't think is going to work. I don't think people are going to be invested in paying for a service like this and it's going to be so limited. However, I will say there is one thing I find really interesting about this, and that's introducing new ways of engaging storytelling. Right. Not only is there you can watch it in portrait and then watch it in landscape, and you get something new based on the peripheral, apparently you can watch a scene in portrait. So for instance, uh, I think an example that was given is a character is in bed FaceTiming. Now, if you watch it in landscape, you get a film perspective of a camera in the room that is watching them. But if you watch it in portrait, you watch it from their phone. So you see them FaceTiming and you see the person that they're FaceTiming to. And so basically what it would encourage is you're watching a seven minute video, but you're watching it multiple times to get new things. And that is really kind of cool. I remember long ago, old YouTube, when you rated things with five stars, there was some tell your own story YouTubes because annotations still exist, which man, yeah. this is throwback to everything. That was and cool. basically a three... 30 second to a minute YouTube video would play. And then at the end, you would have 20 seconds at the end of just blank space where you chose what happened and it would cut to the next, it would link to a private YouTube video, which then showed the next thing. And it would keep doing this over and over. So why do I bring that up? Because it's really interesting to engage new forms of storytelling. One of my favorite films that I think I also mentioned last episode. So you can almost just say this is a companion piece to the last one. Actually, come to think of it, I think I cut that. So this is the first time I'm mentioning it, the last broadcast. And it's basically a, it was released a year before The Blair Witch. It is a mockumentary and it is, um, actually, I think the guys who worked on it, Lance Wheeler and uh, Stephen Avalos, had been in contact with The Blair Witch guys and helped like trade ideas on how to how to work on their projects. Um, and I remember going to a Q&A where they said, like, for a short period of time, they were somewhat jealous of the people who did The Blair Witch because their film took off and The Last Broadcast did not. The Last Broadcast introduced a unique thing to the table, and it was the first satellite digitally streamed movie ever. They were also kind of the first one to do this is all based on reality. Now, you, you did have um, Cannibal Holocaust, but nobody saw yeah. it. And the people who did were people who regretted it. I, th I think some people saw it. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. I think I think a few people saw that one. Yeah. But this was the first film that just uh, this was the first kind of popular film before the Blair Witch came out and completely took over the scene and disappointed everybody because it was fake. Um, that said, this was all real. It's a documentary, so it's made to even feel more authentic. And Lance Wheeler and Stephen Avalos have gone on to do more projects, Lance Wheeler in particular, doing unique storytelling projects. In fact, when I was at the Q&A for their last broadcast being on Blu-ray, I asked him, like, what, what's your new project? I know you've said you've worked on new storytelling methods. And he said they're, they were going around, and I think they said they were at Cannes and other things, and they were doing a dinner party where everyone sat in on a dinner party, put in an earpiece, like a Bluetooth, and then at the end of the table was an AI host. And they had their whole dinner party where they ate real food and all this stuff, but the AI would talk to them. However, there was a mystery going on. And so the AI would talk to specific people and you would have to respond back. And so say, for instance, I was hearing a voice in my headphones right now and I had to respond back to it. Daniel didn't hear that voice. So he'd be like, what's going on? And the dinner party mystery would go on from like, okay, someone at the table might be the person who either stole something or murdered something, and that's their character. But they're then having unique interactions with the AI and therefore unique interactions with other people. 
I don't know the specifics of it because I didn't go to one of these dinner parties because they're very specific. But the point, you can already start to get ideas of how these stories can be told. Oh, well, six different people at the table know this unique information and have to find a way to communicate to each other without letting someone else at the table know about it. That's really cool. All of that sounds so fun. And so when you think about Quibi in the sense of like introducing a new way of telling a story, so maybe you have to shake your phone. Maybe you have to close other apps. Maybe it pulls a, what is it, a Metal Gear Solid 2 or 1 where it reads your save files and now it knows your personal information and that's what's in the episode. Could you imagine? It's like, as I'm saying this, though, I'm starting to realize this might be a horrible idea. Um, someone tell me if Tencent's supporting Quibi. But... Yeah, I, 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 for one, love the idea of apps having more access to my personal data, Melvin. That sounds like a great idea. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. But there's some really interesting ideas to it. But like I said in the beginning, I think it's not going to work out. And I think this is going to be kind of a disaster. I have interest in seeing Del Toro's projects. I have interest in seeing Raimi's projects, but maybe I'll just wait until the, the service dies and just like community, it shows up somewhere else and I can watch it there. But I don't know. I've... Yeah, it's interesting, but this just seems like fancy YouTube. Yeah, doesn't it? It's like fancy TikTok and fancy YouTube with rich people working on it. Yeah, it's just it's like professionally made YouTube videos, which I mean, that's not a horrible idea. I just can't imagine... I cannot imagine being sold a, a eight minute experience that's so compelling that I will pay. Um, so the actual costs here are it's four ninety nine a month for the regular version, eight ninety nine for the ads free version. Although uh, seven ninety nine for ads free, sorry. But apparently, because I was just curious what the price point was, because I was like, how much are they going to charge for this? Um, is that there's gonna be some like unskippable ads at the beginning of videos for the 499 version so that sounds horrible it does sound horrible that sounds like the worst thing ever i can't imagine paying five dollars to watch ads on something that's half of the length of the things i i watch on hulu yeah not that's even. so dumb Se- seven minutes is a third of the length of a tw- like a tw- of like a 22 minute ep- tv episode like what i yeah, there's a lot of interesting, like the whole thing of like you can get different angles because based on like how you hold your phone, that's really great. I think that's a great idea. I can't tell if this is going to be like, I can also like the, the the compatibility with VR is interesting to me. Like in the future, like that's what my mind meant. I can imagine having like a VR movie experience where you can like walk around the room of a character while they're having a conversation with somebody. Uh, that would be really neat. But like, I don't know if it's just a, first step towards new technology situation where this isn't the thing that's going to take off, but like three or four generations away, something that's going to be building off of this idea or technology might take off. But I just can't get past the idea of paying $5 a month to watch eight minute videos like that. Just especially on a three inch screen on a phone, on a phone, Melvin, like it sounds horrible. I, I don't even use Hulu on my phone like I just can't like when I was signing it for my phone service the guy was trying to sell me on like if you pay 90 bucks a month you get like 1080p like streaming on your phone and I was like I don't need to see YouTube videos in 1080p like I I don't need this and like that's just how I feel about this is like I don't need this I don't need to spend five to eight dollars a month to watch fancy vlogs or whatever it is that they're trying to sell me on this is the most curmudgeon and old I'm ever gonna sound on this podcast I just don't need this at all but I'm intrigued by it. I'm intrigued by where this could go. It's very interesting, but it is not worth the money. <laughs> it's just, it's the sort of thing where maybe if it was a dollar a month, then I could totally see trying it out. And then if there was something compelling, I would keep watching it. But there, there's a really, this reminds me of going to a, a family friend's house. And I brought my, this is a long time ago. I had still had my Nintendo Wii and we brought it over. And this was like within the first two years of the Wii existing. And we were playing some games and a friend said, though, he said, I just can't get behind the idea of going to work, coming home tired and wanting to relax by waving my hands around. I don't want to use this technology that's going to make my body move when I would come home to play a game quietly comfortable in blankets with my hands like under the covers (laughs) like why would i want to do all this moving around and 
So when it comes to like wanting to watch a compelling show or like something like that, why would I want to watch it like six or seven times and have to do different things to do that? Yeah. Like I can do that with like on like you just mentioned YouTube. We can do that on YouTube already. I'm not doing it with like moving my phone around or anything, but if anyone's learned of what an alternate reality game is, then they already know how this works. You can just watch Marble Hornets and, and you can just <laughs> check out Everyman Hybrid and all these weird Slenderman oh, things man, before Marble these things Hornets. came out. Like, that takes me back. Yeah, right? I mean, it's crazy. These things still happen where, like, if you want a unique and different experience. In fact, I talked to at the Q&A for last broadcast, I brought these things up. Where the balance of finding out new things that could be interesting is also the practicality of it. And so I'm just not so sure if for $5 on a three inch screen that might be broken or my cover in particular just gets dense and then they take like a couple months to go away. Why would I want to watch something that costs a billion dollars to make? Like this is, I don't like David Lynch's thing where he's like, and they're watching them on their phones because like, it's just borderline idol worship of movies. I can watch movies however I want. All right. Like sometimes I'm just busy or I have to run to the bathroom and I want to keep watching the movie. So I put it on my phone, but this is a case where it's like, Really? You just want to have this be exclusive to your phone? I don't know. It's just I like you can hear it. And I think most commentators talking about it. Nobody thinks this is a good good. Nobody thinks this is execution of a good good execution of a good idea. I think the creativity is good. I think the execution is going to be pretty terrible. Just like Disney Plus. Oh, wow. Way to, way to tie it all together, Melvin. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Monthly Movie News. We hope you had a good time listening. If you like what Cinematic Doctrine has to offer, be sure to check out our other shows like Trailer Talk and our movie reviews. You can also leave a review on your respective podcast app or consider supporting us on Patreon. If you support as little as $3, you can vote on a movie we'll review at the end of each month, as well as gain access to the Sindoc Pre-Show, a casual discussion between Daniel and I as we talk movies, Christianity, and life itself. And remember to follow our Cinematic Doctrine social media from Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, including a Facebook group where you can join the conversation with other like-minded Christian movie fans. From there, we'll ask about topics you'd like for Daniel and I to discuss on the next episode of Monthly Movie News, so be sure to follow us wherever you can. All of this will be available in the show notes. Until next time, stay cool. Want some Cinematic Doctrine swag? You're in luck! We've got 3-inch Cinematic Doctrine logo stickers exclusive for Patreon supporters. Perfect for your travel mug or laptop. Head over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine, link in the show notes, and choose the independent theater tier. Doing so will net you other perks too. But let's be real, the podcast stickers are the coolest perk. So get yourself some podcast stickers by supporting on Patreon.